Let's do it, ladies and gentlemen. You're listening to WBH Radio. Uh, I'm your host, William Holly. We have a very special guest here today, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Matthew Goodman. Thank you for joining me, sir. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Mr. Goodman is the author of a book I recently read, which I thoroughly enjoyed. It's called The City Game, Triumph, Scandal, and the Legendary Basketball Team. Now, Matthew, I was interested in this book because uh, you write about a local college. <laughs> yes. The City College of New York. Mm-hmm. And um, back in 2010, I played college basketball for York College in Queens. Mm-hmm. And City College is a part of our conference. I competed against them. And I thought, man, wow, it's cool to have a book about our humble little conference or, or our, mm-hmm. um, our league. But this book is a a lot more than just about a basketball team. Sure. And City College basketball was a lot different back in the day. I mean, they were playing in Madison Square Garden. I mean, it it was big-time basketball. It was. Matthew, can you paint a picture for us, the height of City College basketball? Sure. Uh, You know, we're talking about... Well, let's, let's start by saying that City College, to this day, has a distinction that no college basketball team has. Uh, They accomplished something that had never been accomplished before and will never be accomplished again, which is that they won the NIT and the NCAA in the same year. Uh, The only college ever to do that. Um, They were huge heroes. Uh, So we're talking, that was in 1950. And in 1950, college basketball was hugely popular in New York. I mean, other than pro baseball, it was probably the biggest game in town, Mm -hmm. you know? It was bigger than pro basketball for sure, right? You know, they played, City College played their home games, not at City College, they played their home games in Madison Square Garden. In the garden. In the garden, and the uh, the, the old garden, right? You know, up on uh, 50th Street. And when they played, they filled the place, right? 18,000 people on a Friday night to see City College play. The Knicks were also playing in Madison Square Garden, and they were lucky to draw 6,000, 7,000 people, right? When, when there was a schedule conflict, and there was a college game, and there was the Knicks, the Knicks were the, the team that got sh- shunted downtown to the uh, armory on 23rd Street, right? Because the, the college game was the big game. And, you know, nationally speaking, there were a lot of New York City schools that were, you know, top national schools, you know, not just city, St. John's, yeah. Long Island University, LIU, which is actually a Brooklyn school, yeah. um, you know, NYU, Manhattan College. These were all basketball powerhouses, you know, it, back then. It, it was amazing to read about it in the book, this this era yeah. where City College was the biggest draw in town, even bigger than the Knicks. Yeah. yeah. Why was this the case at this period? Why was college basketball such a big deal? Well, you know, uh, the the NIT started in the 30s. Uh, you know, it, it, it started, I want to say, in like 34, something like that. And there wasn't really a, a pro league at that time. Um, in New York. Mm-hmm. So college basketball sort of had a running start, you know, so to speak. And, uh, you know, it had kind of ready-made, a ready-made audience because, you know, you had people who had gone there and were loyal and, mm-hmm. you know, wanted to see their team play and would come out to the garden and so forth. City also had a very famous coach, uh, a guy by the name of Nat Holman, who uh, was arguably the greatest player of his day, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he, he uh, it, Nat Holman was given the opportunity to, ha- to, to have the Converse All-Star sneaker named after him. I learned you know, that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they went to him and they said, you know, we want you to be on, you know, to be our sneaker rep. And he was already making so much money. He was, you know, he he was the highest paid player of his time. And he said, no, he didn't need the, the gig, you know. So, so the Chuck Taylors that everybody's wearing could yeah, have been the Nat, Nat Holman. Nat Holman, that's exactly, the, that's exactly my line, yeah. It could have been the Converse All-Star Nat Holman sneakers, you know. 
Uh, I mean, he was on Wheaties boxes, yeah. you know, he was, you know, he, you know, he, he advertised Ovaltine, uh, you know, whatever. He was a big star. So uh, that added to the allure. You know, this city whole as well. team. And, and again, you do a great job of painting that picture like this was a big deal. Yeah. And it's hard to to fathom that because, again, we play now with Division three conference, you know, right. often forgotten about. But these Guys, this team was the talk of the town. Right. What can you tell us about the the quality, well not the quality, the, the makeup of the student body of CCNY? Right. Because it was kind of like immigrants and right. black. Right. Talk to us about the students that were on that campus. City was City College was then, as it is today, um, a really special institution. Um, in the in the city of in the, the history of the city of New York, you know its its goal in 1950 was the same as it was when it was started uptown in Har- Harlem in 1907, as it is today, which is to take the brightest of New York's high school kids whose parents can't afford, you know, um, an Ivy League education, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And allow them uh, uh, an education that in 1950 was arguably as good as any other college in the country. You know, City College has 11 Nobel Prize winners uh, among their alumni. It's the it's the the most of any college in the world. Uh, really? Yeah, from City College. Um, you know, it was called Harvard on Hudson. It was called you know uh, uh, you know it was just it was. Um, you know, a top um, academic institution. It was very hard to get into City College. You had to take a special test to get in. You had to, you know, maintain very high grade uh, point average, and um, and the co- and the student body was um, about eighty percent Jewish mm-hmm. and about ten percent black, and. Um, and the the basketball team was the same, you know. The basketball team was made up in, entirely of what today we would call minorities. Yeah. You know, it, it was made up entirely of Jewish players and black players. Mm-hmm. Um, this is before, by the way, the NBA integrated, right? This is only two years after Jackie Robinson broke the color line mm-hmm. in baseball uh, the city college team was eight Jewish players and four black players. Yeah. You know, with a Jewish head coach, Jewish assistant coach. So um, this opportunity for these these athletes and their families, yeah, was a big deal. Oh, huge! Because it's a top notch education. Yeah, for for free. Right, for free. That's the other point. It so was for free. You you can't squander these opportunities. That's right. Tell us about perhaps one of the players, uh, Dan Broad, or tell us about one of right. the players and how how important this opportunity was for not only the 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 player but their family. Sure, I mean you're t- you know these are kids who are uh, the children of immigrants, um, you know either Eastern European Jewish immigrants or Caribbean immigrants, you know the descendants of slaves, right? Yeah. Uh, for a lot of these guys, maybe all of them, come to think of it, it was, they were the first generation of their family to go to college, right? And, you know, a kind of assimilation and a kind of integration into the American mainstream that might take generations to succeed. Once the kid got into City College and got a City College education, it could be accomplished very quickly yeah. at that point. Um, so, you know, these are working class kids or, or poor, poor and working class. You know, a lot of them came from the Bronx. Um, you know, the, really the centerpiece of the book, uh, in a way, is the relationship of these two players on the team, really three players on the team, two black and one Jewish guy named uh, Ed Warner, who um, was uh, an orphan from from Harlem. Floyd Lane, um, amazing person, still still around, mm-hmm. uh, from the Bronx, uh, uh, also black, the child of a single mother mm-hmm. um, who worked as a domestic, and Eddie Roman, who was a white Jewish guy, also from the Bronx, 
His father was a house painter. Mm-hmm. Um, and the three of them were best friends yeah. and, you know, pl- you know, hung out together, played ball together. You know, Floyd's mother referred to Eddie Warner and Ed Roman as my, my two other sons, yeah. you know, my two Eddies. And uh, was very, very unusual at that time, you know, f- to have these three, you know, to have this kind of very close interracial friendship. And they stayed close yeah. their whole life, um, which was amazing. And I, I talk about that in the book. So they were really a special team, you they know, were. In, in a lot of ways. They were. Um, you know, and then the thing that we haven't mentioned, you know, I don't mean to, you know, uh, you know, provide a spoiler, but, you know, what ends up happening to them is that, you know, they win the double championship. And then the following year, they are arrested um, and charged with conspiring with gamblers to shave points. Matthew, it all comes crashing down yeah. after flying high, accomplishing right. something no team had ever done. Uh, double championship, NIT, NCAA. They get arrested for, in short, point shaving? Point shaving, yeah. What was the beginning of that? What ha- what happened right. to to be the toast of the town? Right to now be in handcuffs, standing before a judge. <laughs> That's right. I mean, they lit- literally overnight they went from heroes to villains. I mean, like literally in the course of a night, you know, they were arrested, and the next day they were a scandal. Right. So, um, you know, part of what my book is about, as as uh, you know, you've you've picked up is is really a much larger story about corruption, you know, um, in the city and the way that the city works, you know, what the game of the city really is. And, uh, you know, gambling was a huge enterprise, right? I mean, it's a huge enterprise now, of course, you know, even more so. Uh, But it wasn't legal back then. Mm -hmm. And, And yet you had tens of thousands of dollars bet on every game, you know, at... Madison Square Garden, right? Mm-hmm. I think it's three. Somebody said three hundred thousand dollars. You know, on every game, um, you had hundreds, if not thousands, of bookmakers operating in New York City at that time, all illegally, of mm-hmm. course. Um, you had point spreads printed in the newspapers, right? When it was illegal to be betting on these games, yet the newspapers were printing the spreads, right? Wow. It was it was uh, an open secret that this kind of thing was going on, right? So, uh, and, and, you know, Madison Square Garden knew about it, the NCAA knew about it, they didn't really do anything about it. Well, there had been um, rumors of point shaving for a long time, you know, we should mention that point shaving means not losing a game intentionally. It means just changing the score, trying to manipulate the score so that you win under a certain amount. So right. if you're favored to win by 10, you'll win by 8 or 7 or whatever it may be. So players do this by perhaps missing a shot on purpose yeah. or turning over the ball. Exactly. Or that, and they're, they're, uh, the person they're guarding blow by them for an easy basket. It's very easy to do in now, basketball. People may not understand, if, if, if these athletes are competitive, right? why would they allow this to seep in? Why would they even take on uh, the point shaving. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. They were not being asked to lose the game. Right. And I think, I think that if they had been, their competitive instincts would have, would have you, know, uh, you know, set in and they would have said no. Um, in fact, I know that that mm-hmm. would have happened because they, they told me that. Mm-hmm. You know, I spoke to all the surviving members of mm-hmm. the team for this book. So here's the situation, and this is one of the things that I was really trying to get at in my book. You're a kid. Well, let me just say this. These athletes were uh, just absolutely vilified in the newspapers, right? And in the city, right? From the highest pedestal to the lowest, Mm -hmm. right? And, um, you know, overnight, as we said, they went from heroes to villains. Um, And it was very easy to kind of make them into caricatures um, as bad guys, as as amoral guys, as guys who were willing to sell out their team for a buck, you know, willing to sell out their city, willing to sell out their school, you know, and so their fans 
for, you know, for some easy money. And that's the way they were always viewed. Mm -hmm. And what I was trying to do in um, the book was to try to add a little more complexity to that story and to get the reader to interrogate himself or herself and say, okay, it's very easy to say that you would not have done that Mm -hmm. if you were in that situation, right? That you wouldn't have shaved points. And maybe you wouldn't have, you know, certain people didn't, right? Certain people said no. Uh, You know, Junius Kellogg, for instance, from, you know, Manhattan College said no. Um, But let's think about, let's think about the context. And this is part of what the book is about. You know, you're, you're a poor kid. Every night you see, like Eddie Roman, you see your uh, parents sitting at the kitchen table worrying about how are they going to pay off the mortgage of their house, right? Somebody offers you $5,000, which is more money than you've ever seen in your life and ever will see in your life. You're not going to make a lot of money playing basketball, you know? Uh, These are working class kids, right? And you don't have to lose the game. You just have to change the score of the game, which you figure nobody's going to remember the score in two weeks anyway, right? Right, right? And by the way, you know that your teammates are doing it, and you know that the guys on the other team are doing it, and you know that uh, this has been going on for a long time because you grew up in the schoolyards and you were talking to the older guys Mm -hmm. who would tell you about what they were doing and they were doing it back then. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you know that everybody inside the garden is making money off of you, Mm -hmm. right? Everybody in the garden that night, you know, other than the fans who paid to get in, are getting a cut of it, right? The the coaches, the sports writers, the promoter, yeah. the vendors, yeah. the referees, they're all making money. Everybody's making money except you. And you're the only reason that they're all there right. is because of your talent, right? Similar to the like college situation we've seen. Exactly. In, uh, even uh, recently, like exactly. before NIL. Exactly. Everybody's making money except for the players. Exactly. So these players were faced with this predicament. And, and you know... And we haven't talked about this either. You know that the cop on the corner is taking money from bookmakers. Wow. And you know that the uh, cops, either the cops, the politicians, the church, they're all, they're all involved in this, right? Well, if you're in a situation like that, maybe you would take the money. You know, I don't know. You know, the point I'm trying to make is that they weren't bad. They made a bad decision for sure. I'm not trying to say that they did the right thing. And the players themselves regretted ultimately what they had done. Uh, What I'm trying to say is maybe you can understand why they did what they did, right? And when you see, you know, somebody, you know, a young kid in the paper today who's in trouble for something, well, maybe the situation is more complicated. For sure. You know? For sure. You offered offered great context in that uh, situation. Who approached the CCNY Mm -hmm. Beavers about the point shaving. Mm -hmm. Who was given the payouts? Right. Um, Well, and and that's another thing, you know, another aspect of the context. These players, um, you know, according to the NCAA, they weren't allowed to be paid, right, right, for, for, for playing basketball. So what did they do in the summertime, right? They played... In the Catskills hotels, okay. right? Now, they weren't allowed, quote unquote, to be paid to play basketball. So what happened was they got hired to be waiters, to be busboys, right, in these hotels. But they weren't hired because they were such great waiters. They were hired to play basketball. Mm-hmm. And they were being paid as waiters. But they were really there, you know, to be basketball players because... The fans liked to see them play basketball and they would play bad. You know, the hotels had teams and they would play against the teams of other hotels, you know, up in the Borscht Belt. Right. Right. So that in itself was, uh, you know, basically corrupt. But what happened was that there were these pools that were created, you know, while they were playing the games. And, you know, the, the spectators would, you know, would pick a number and, the, and uh, you know, let's say, you know, 110. And if the combined score of the two teams added up to 110, you won the pot. Right. And you won all the money that people had put mm-hmm. into the pot, right? 
So what ended up happening was that gamblers started saying, okay, I got 110. I'll give you half if you can manipulate the score to end up at 110, right? right? Whether you win or lose, you know, it, it yeah. adds up to 110. And that, in the Catskills, is where these players first learned how to manipulate the score, okay. right? How to shave points, right? And one of the guys who was up there that summer was a guy by the name of Salazzo, um, who was a, a gambler. And uh, he was in league with a guy named Eddie Gard, who was a former player for LIU. Mm -hmm. And together they decided they were going to set up this point shaving ring, you know, where Salazzo was gonna bet on the games and they were gonna have some of the players in their pocket and they would win, you know, the, the shaved games. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they went to the players and they said, you know, we'll give you X amount of dollars, you know, to shave points in this game. And that's, that's where it started. But so, so the lots of mob involvement, it, it's unclear, but there were indications that yes, he, but, you know, he lived in the same building as Frank Costello, who was the big mob boss, you know, in New York City. But eventually uh, there would be some mob ties to the point shaving, right? 100%. 100%. Uh, yeah. And, you know, the thing, the biggest, the biggest uh, bookmaker in New York at that time, and he becomes a major character in my story, is a guy named Harry Gross mm -hmm. out of Brooklyn. He, he, was, he, he was in, uh, he was near Ebbets Field, right? And he, he used to run his operation out of the back room of a, of a, a bar and grill called the Dugout Bar and Grill. And, uh, you know, he had uh, 10 million, I forget exactly what, you know, the amount of money was that was running through his bookmaking operation, but it was unbelievably big, right? And he protected himself by shelling out a million dollars a year in what he called ICE, <laughs> right? Which was bribe money to cops and yeah. politicians, including the mayor and the police commissioner, both of whom left both of whom were run out of office that year in bookmaking scandals, right? So we're talking about stuff that goes to the very top. The mayor and police commissioner? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. This is how rampant this numbers and bookmaking was. Correct, correct. Harry Gross had paid money to, had given money to the mayor and had given money to the police commissioner. Wow. Okay? The police commissioner, by the way, was best friend of the coach of St. John's. That's another story. We can get into that. <laughs> But, but, but anyway, this guy, Harry Gross, used to have cops come in, you know, on paydays into the back room with the dugout, and he would just hand them the envelopes, right, with yeah. the, you know, with the payment, right? So it was really open, you know, this kind of, this kind of, this kind of corruption. And that's why I say I got a lot more than just a story about a basketball team, because uh, the scandal, there's uh, politicians on the take, mm -hmm. police officers on the take. So it would make sense, and you talk about the context that these athletes would look back and think like, man, this is just a little innocent thing. Everybody's involved uh, but us. In fact, at first, when some of the players were approached, they said no. That's Didn't right. Didn't Ed Warner, who was someone who ended up getting in trouble behind it, at first he said, no go. Yeah. Uh, Floyd Lane did, for sure. Floyd Lane said no three times. Um, and the only time he finally said yes was... Um, when he realized that all of his teammates were also doing it, and it was pointless for him not to, yeah, they weren't going to, they weren't going to be, they weren't playing straight anyway. Um, they all had different motivations for doing what they were doing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Floyd Lane didn't want to do it, said no, didn't feel good about doing it. He finally agreed to do it. He says he never changed the way that he played. You know, as a result of this, and. He never spent any of the money except for $110 that he used to buy his mother a washing machine for Christmas one year. She was a domestic, you know, and she washed other people's clothes, yeah. but she never had a washing machine of his own. He spent the money on the washing machine for his mother, and then he tied up the rest in a handkerchief and buried it in a flower pot in his bedroom, and he never touched it. Eddie Warner, I'm sorry, Eddie uh, Roman hid the money in a, in a cigar box in his basement, never touched a dollar of it. Uh, he was going to give it to his mother later on to help her pay the mortgage on the, ha on the house. 
Uh, Erwin Dambrot, you mentioned Tim earlier, who became a dentist. Mm -hmm. I think he's the only player in history, by the way. He was, he was uh, the number one pick the next year of the New York Knicks right. after the double championship season, and he turned them down to go to dental school. Um, I think he's the only number one pick who's ever t turned right. down. And that's a know? good example to yeah. highlight where the, the pro ranks were right. at that time. It he wasn't was, as lucrative as it oh, is today. Oh, no, no, no. He, he said, was, no, I think I have a better life as a dentist. That, and I'm sure he did. <laughs> I'm sure he did. He had a very good practice in Forest Hills. But Matthew, so. with, with these kids... You, they're not even spending the money. Like These no. are just some kids trying to stay afloat. That's Many it. of them are. That's it. One guy yeah. brought his mom a washing machine. Right. The other guy planned on giving it to his family. Mm -hmm. The players weren't always successful right. when it came to point shaving. Sometimes they couldn't make the right. spread That's match. Right. Were they ever up yeah. against a, a threat of violence from the people who were repaying them yeah. for failure? Well... Let, let me say this. Uh, and by the way, speaking of Danbrod, Danbrod only did it once, and then he felt so terrible he never did it again. But he was still caught up in it, you know, the you know, with the getting arrested with all the rest of them. I did talk to one guy, um, a guy named Herb Cohen, who um, took money, and he's still alive down in Florida. And I talked to him, and I, and he said to me, he said, "Look, I would go, I would go to a Friday night game at the Garden." And I'd, and I'd walk onto the court and I'd look around at 18,000 people and I'd think, where did all, they all paid. Yeah. Every one of them paid to get into this place. Where did that money go? Right. He said, not to me, <laughs> right? Yeah. He said, uh, I was making five bucks a game and selling my free tickets, right. you know? So, you know, he was sort of unrepentant. He was the only one who was kind of unrepentant. <laughs> Plus he hated Nat Holman. He was that like, coach. He's, yeah, he hated him. He was like, fuck that guy. Yeah. Literally. I mean, he said, fuck that guy. <laughs> I'm, not, you know, th that's my money, yeah. right? Um, but yeah, they, uh, the CCNY team was never very good at point shaving. And every game that they shaved points in, they lost, right? Because right. the thing about the way that City played, it wasn't like any of those guys were necessarily like, you know, they, they played a team game. It was, they weren't like stars, right? Like there was a, a, a guy on LIU, you know, Sherman White, who was a big star. Like, you know, you know he was like, uh, you know, LeBron. I mean, he, he, you know, he could just do everything, right? Um, City didn't really have a, a guy like that. You know, they didn't, you know, they had, they had five guys or seven guys who played together, yeah. right? They won because they all knew where everybody was gonna be on the court, right? Mm -hmm. They played a kind of emotion offense. It was a very intelligent game. Uh, they didn't really use set plays, you know, they played a kind of improvised, you know, game. Mm -hmm. And when that kind of play got interfered with, it all kind of went haywire, yeah. right? And LIU, which was taking money a lot, they managed to, sh they, they were really good at shaving points, right? <laughs> like if they were favored to win by six, they won by five, yeah. right? Or, you know, sometimes it got really thin, right? Like if they want, you know, if they were favored to win by four, they won by three. This, right? That's very hard to very pull hard. In basketball yeah, game. They were really good at it. But, um, but City kind of, they, they never were able to mm -hmm. do that. And, they, you know, the, the, the season after they won the double championship, they, won, they lost a bunch of games. Trying to point shave. That they should have won. Yeah, trying to shave points. Well, yeah. what, what, what consequences did they face from the mob? Well, you know, it, it, there was always the threat. Yeah. You know, there was always that threat of, like, you know, we've got our hooks into you now. Yeah, we're going to get our, 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 ankle, our knees broke this time. Yeah. I mean, that was never said explicitly, right. but that was always the sort of under... Undertone, yeah. What a climate for these kids to be participating in and playing. Um, eventually, there was an investigation, and mm -hmm. we've uh, discussed that so many people were on the take, mm -hmm. even as high as the mayor's office. What can you tell us about the investigation that took place to take this down? Who was behind it? Uh, what was their motivation? You know, uh, mm -hmm. why? Well, you know, what happened was, uh, the, well, the arrests of City College happened in February of 1951. Mm -hmm. City had, had just played a game uh, against Temple down in Philly, and they were coming back on the train to the old Madison Square Garden. Um, 
and they got off the train. It was about 1.30 in the morning, a uh, rainy, drizzly night. It was like a, you know, an old film noir movie, you know, mm-hmm. with a, you know, there were four cops in overcoats and fedoras, you know, uh, waiting for them on the, on the, on the platform. Who they were working for the DA, the Manhattan DA, a guy named Frank Hogan, and they arrested uh, five guys, you know, uh, on the team, and brought them downtown and charged them with conspiring with gamblers to alter the score of a basketball game, which was illegal. Mm-hmm. And you know, the the players were uh, interrogated all night long. They were kept in separate rooms. Mm-hmm. They were not allowed to talk to an attorney. Um, they were not allowed to call their parents. Nat Holman did nothing for them, by the way, the coach. coach. You know, he, he did not go down there with them. He didn't even call the president of this college to tell them what it, tell him what had happened. Uh, he left it to his assistant, Bobby Santa, to have him contact the parents, you know, about what had happened. Why do you uh, think that is? Why did Nat Holman not uh, accompany them? Why did he not try Nat, to assist in any way? Nat Holman was very good at protecting, you know, himself. CYA, as they say. Covey yeah, asked, yeah. Do we? Do we? Was he involved in the point shaving? No, no, he okay. definitely wasn't involved with it. The question is, did he know about it? Okay. Um, and my indication is that he probably did, but it was better for him to look away, mm-hmm. right? Uh, he wasn't going to gain anything by calling attention to that, the fact that this was going on. And he survived it, you know. Um, you his know, name he, is on the gym right now. His name is on the gym. You got it. Yeah. His name is on the gym. Uh, he was uh, the coach at City until he retired. His name is on the gym. He's in the Hall of Fame mm-hmm. in Springfield, wow. the Basketball Hall of Fame. His assistant, Bobby Sand, who was a great guy, yeah. he took the fall, right? He was fired. He was, he was, you know, brought down. He wasn't allowed to coach anymore, wasn't allowed to teach. He was a great teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had to sue, he had to sue the, the school, you know, for years in order to get his job back. Yes. Um, so, you know, it's sort of a case of the big guy cruising mm-hmm. and the little guy, the low man on the totem pole taking the fall. Uh, so these players were interrogated all night long. Um, you know, they were lied to by the cops. And finally, they, they broke, you know, and they admitted, you know, what they had done. And um, they, you know, went on trial. Uh, eventually, uh, guys were caught from f- three of the other schools um, in the area, from LIU, from, from Manhattan College, from NYU. Uh, only one team did not get implicated in the in you know in the scandal that was St. John's um but you know these guys ended up uh being found guilty most of them cut deals um with the cops the only ones who didn't were the two black stars uh one from City College Ed Warner one from LIU Sherman White the two best players on those teams who would be who would have been stars in the NBA for sure Sherman White was just about to be drafted in the first round by the Knicks. Ed Warner was going to be drafted by the Celtics. But they were sent to jail, right? They were the first athletes sent to jail for gambling-related offenses, right? You remember this, the Chicago Black Sox of 19, uh, what was it, 1919? They didn't go to jail. They were trying to lose the games. They were intentionally losing the games of the World Series. They never went to jail. But the two black players, and very few black players were involved in this, it was mainly white guys, uh, were, uh, they went to Rikers, right? And they spent a year in jail. How does this happen? Why does this happen? All of these men go down for the same crime, and the only ones to go to jail are the black guys. How? Like, what was the reasoning... For that, how did that go to Well, I talk about that in the book, and I analyze the judge's decision, and it's very clear to me 
that there's a racial subtext to his to his decision, right? You know, he, you know, he he didn't like he didn't like those guys. You know, he you know he didn't use the word uppity, but there, you know, that was the sort of implication. You know, he talked about them going to nightclubs. He talked, you know, about them hanging out with the wrong kind of people. He talked about them not maintaining their academic average and so forth. And as a result of that. Um, you know, they they ended up in prison, right? As you say, they were not involved in the most games. They didn't take the most money. Wow. They didn't try to get more player, other players implicated in that. But they were the ones, um, you know, who went down. So there's a racial element of this as well, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then the last piece, you know, which we were just alluding to, is that um, I think that there's every indication that the other major basketball program in the city at that time, St. John's, Mm -hmm. was also involved in point shaving, and yet none of their players were ever implicated in it. Why? Uh, I would argue, and do argue in the book, that it was because they were being protected by a police force that was overwhelmingly Irish Catholic, um, St. John's, of course, was a Catholic school, yeah. the Catholic school. Uh, the police commissioner, William O'Brien, was literally the friend of the coach of St. John's. He was identified in the news- newspapers as St. John's number one fan. He would sit on the bench, or behind the bench, mm-hmm. rather, during the games, right? And the, now, I, I can't prove this part, but everybody told me that this happened, Um the word was that the cardinal of New York, who was a very powerful uh, cardinal, mm-hmm. um, went to the DA, Frank Hogan, and said, Frank, I will support you in your race for governor next year. Wow. A, 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 an Irish Catholic guy like Frank Hogan would not have succeeded without the cardinal's support. support. I will you know, get you everything you need but you don't touch our boys. You don't touch our boys. And um, they, St. John's never was touched, right? Wow. They, they skated. And... Um, one of the, the players the, from St. John's who, who skated, mm-hmm. he's one of the all-time leading scorers. Yeah, he is history. the all-time leading scorer for St. John's in a, in a four-year program, yeah. for sure. Uh, yeah, and... Um, uh, St. John's, unlike the other schools, never cut back on their basketball program, right? right. I mean, when you know, after the scandal happened, City, LAU, NYU, they all cut back on their on their basketball programs. They stopped playing in the garden, mm-hmm. right? City doesn't play their games in the garden anymore. Oh, so. right? City now has a Div Three program, which you you, yeah. you mentioned. Um, which of these teams is still a basketball power? St. John's, John's. right? Chris Mullen, et cetera. Um, And that goes back to the scandal of 1950, that St. John's was allowed to maintain its program at the high level, whereas the other programs were not. They were able to survive that scandal, still thriving. Uh, Frank Hogan, who was the DA who initiated this investigation, he was on his crusade to take it down, but even he was impacted by... I guess uh, the muscle behind the Cardinal, like mm-hmm. he had to, I guess, look out for himself and he didn't go after St. John's the way he could have went, uh, the way he went after CCNY right. and the other schools. Um, Frank Hogan, which was, uh, it was interesting. Corruption was so rampant when he made the decision to do this investigation. He said, I, I can't trust these cops that you have walking the beat. He said, give me the cops that are coming fresh out of the academy. Mm-hmm. So he got some newbies to serve as detectives. They had never even been to a police station house. Right. That was the only way he can trust these officers, those that weren't, I guess, corrupted by the veterans. That actually wasn't Frank Hogan. That was the, that was the, the Brooklyn DA, okay. Miles McDonald, who was this very honest guy. But uh, he wanted to investigate uh, mob influence. Right. In bookmaking, there had been a big expose in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle about it. And yeah, as you say, he understood 
that the cop on the corner, that all the detectives were on the take, right? And he didn't want them to, um, to be the ones investigating themselves, right? right. And, and so it was almost kind of like a Serpico kind of a thing, right? Where, you know, sort of 20 years earlier, where um, he said, well, how are we going to do this? You know, how are we going to uh, investigate the cops? And um, he, he hit on this idea, as you just said, which is to take uh, to interview the entire graduating class of the police academy. Mm-hmm. And we're going to choose, I forget, 20, I forget exactly how many it was, uh, of the best and the brightest yeah. recruits from the academy who are not yet corrupted, right. right, by the system, and who are young and who can kind of pass for college students. And they went undercover as college students um, in order to root out, you know, the way that the mob and the cops were involved, you know, with with bookmaking on college campuses. And that's exactly what happened. After the players were arrested and before they uh, were convicted, how how frightened were they and their families? Mm. After they were arrested? Yeah. But I, yeah, it was a very bad time. It was a very bad time for them. Um, because, you know, they knew they had done it, right? right. They knew that something bad was going to happen. And... Um, They had been thrown out of school also. You know, they were students and still attending the school, but the college kicked them out. Um, You tell these stories about the police walking them to their homes to retrieve the money. Yeah, And their families are just uh, broken down, mortified. Exactly. There is their lovely son in handcuffs with the law enforcement, like mom's crying. Like, it it was an amazing picture. Good kid and good kids, you know, kids who had never been in trouble before. These were not criminal kids, you know. And uh, yeah, and they were ashamed of themselves. A lot of them had trouble just leaving the house, you know, because they were known. They were, you know, and they were, um, you know, shunned. Um, And so it was a really hard time for them. There was one player that was arrested after the group, like kind of like the group was arrested. Was that Fred Lane? Floyd Lane was arrested. Yeah, right. He was actually being celebrated on campus yeah. as one of the guys that, that yeah. wasn't on the take. The campus was hoisting him up right. while these other folks uh, were arrested and they yeah. were, were, were shamed. But eventually they got to Lane. They figured out he was one of the takers yeah. too. Floyd Lane is an amazing story. I mean, he's kind of the hero of the book. Um, you know, I got to talk to him on several occasions for the book. And just an amazing individual um, who who ends up having a kind of redemption arc, really, you know, in the story, because he ends up becoming the coach of City College, you know, 20 years later, you know, 20 years after he's walked, after he's walked off the campus by, you know, by detectives, he comes back to the campus as the coach Mm -hmm. of the City College basketball team in this sort of amazing tableau, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And he spent his life trying to clear his name. Um, and to get back into the the, the game of basketball, um, you know, worked for years in, you know, the toughest parts of New York, you know, during the toughest years of the city's history, you know, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, you know, he worked in the Bronx, in the South Bronx, worked in Harlem, in, in community centers, mm-hmm. working with kids, trying to, you know, keep them off of drugs, out of gangs, yeah. you know. In school, he ended up getting hundreds of kids scholarships to colleges, right? Mentoring kids. Uh, one of his protégés um, was a kid known as Tiny, mm-hmm. who went on to become the Hall of Fame player, Nate Tiny Archibald. Floyd Lane was his mentor, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but yes, as you say, so he was an amazing, is an amazing individual. Um, and yet... He was not one of the guys who was originally arrested, mm-hmm. as you were talking about. And he, I, he might even have been the only member of the original starting five that, who was not arrested in that first roundup. Wait, yeah. And so he was lionized on the college as being the, the one honest guy, right. right? And there was a big uh, kind of a pep rally on the campus, right, to support the, mm-hmm. the team and to support, or support the, the remaining members of the team. And Floyd, you know, was, was cheered when he knew 
that he had done it too. Yeah. And uh, he was caught, man. He was just, it was tough. Yeah. Because he knew that he wasn't the guy that people thought he was. Mm -hmm. And he kind of knew that he was eventually going to get caught. And that's exactly what happened. That is a great redemption story. Um, to, uh, and you say he's like the hero of the book. I, I found myself getting excited when I learned that he would return and earn uh, a position as the head coach after this scandal, mm -hmm. 20 years after the scandal. But those days after the uh, the scandal for some of the other players, talk to me about some of the shame they would feel and how they would be uh, treated amongst the community that once adored them. Right. Yeah, no, it was really hard for these guys, you know, because, you know, they had been playing. Look, the City College team represented so much of what New York City wanted to believe about itself, mm -hmm. right? They were an integrated team. You know, they had defeated the this top t team, Kentucky, you know, which was this racist in this bastion of old time segregation, you know, that had no black players on the team, would not have a black player on the team for another 20 years, mm -hmm. um, long after the other teams of the SEC had integrated. Um, you know, the, the head coach was named Adolf, right? Adolf Rupp. Uh, they refused to shake the hands of the City College players, yeah. you know, when they played them. And, and City handed Adolf Rupp the worst loss in his entire career, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that cemented City College in the hearts of New York City. Mm -hmm. um, so they, you know, they were the sort of epitome of the outsider making good. You know, they represented integration. They represented uh, the triumph of the immigrant. They represented you know, um, civic virtue, really. And and so they were placed on this kind of pedestal, which they hadn't asked for, but right. but they were, right? And so the fall was all the more great because they had been placed so high on the pedestal, right? So when they fell, they fell hard. And, you know, one of the players on the team, you know, uh, would only take the subway during non-rush hours, because he didn't want to, he didn't want to be recognized. Wow. You know, when he was going to work, he would only go early in the morning or late at night. Right. You know, um, and they, you know, they kept unlisted phone numbers. Sometimes they were recognized on the street and they denied who they were. No, 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 I'm not him. I just look like him. You know, et cetera, et cetera. And that went on for years. You know, where they were living in the shadow of this scandal. Um, and, you know, again, one of the things that I, that I was trying to do with this book was to get them out from under the shadow of that scandal to show who they really were. Um, Floyd Lane spent years trying to get into the NBA. You know, he said to me, just five minutes on a, on a professional court would have changed the whole course of my life. But they were blacklisted for life. Right, none of them were ever allowed to play in the NBA. They spent years playing in these semi-pro leagues, you know, for mm -hmm. fifty bucks a game, yeah. driving themselves to the games in Pennsylvania, wherever it was. Right, um, Floyd, um, you know, you know, tried to have tryouts in the in the NBA, and he never never was able to. And finally, after about ten years of that, he gave he gave it up and. You know, he, he loved kids, he loved working with kids, and that's when he went into coaching and into working in the community centers. Were any of them uh, bitter because they were kind of, I guess, scapegoated? Because mm -hmm. everybody was on the take, everybody was yeah. making money, yeah. and then the world kind of came crashing down yeah. on them. Was there a bitterness to uh, You know, I, I, that's a really good question, Will. I don't know the answer to that. They wouldn't ad admit that. But it had to be there, yeah. you know. Um, I'll tell you what they were bitter about um, that they did express to me was that St. John's never, never, never paid the price, you know. Be, you know, there was one guy, I won't say which one, uh, but I talked to his kid. And his kid, you know, there was an HBO documentary that was made about this scandal yeah. uh, a number of years ago uh, called City Dump. And... Um, there was a St. John's player, um, who Al McGuire, who 
uh, was one of the talking heads, okay. you know, in the scandal, talking about the scandal. And this guy, this kid told me that he was watching with his father and his father leaped up and he said, how dare he talk about this? He was in this up to his eyeballs, wow. right? So I think that that was, I think that that was the bitterness, you know, that, that, you know, you know, their attitude was, well, we did it. Yeah. We did do it. You know, we paid the price for it. And, you know, not everybody, not everybody paid the price. Why did you decide to take on this project? Um, you know, my dad went to City. Um, so I had grown up kind of hearing the story um, um, about this kind of legendary team. But I didn't really know the details about it. And to me, it was this sort of, you know, the more that I sort of looked into it, um, it was this kind of amazing story of a team that, you know, where the arc is kind of from here to here and then from here and then back, you know, and then kind of back up. Um, you know, as I always say, to, as I always say to people, um, if the story had ended with them winning the double championship, I wouldn't have written the book because that's, that's a story that we've, you know, that's Hoosiers, you know what I mean? Like that's a story that we've read before. Right. You know, to me, the amazing thing is the rise and then the fall, right? And kind of what character got revealed in the course of the rise and the fall. And to me, what was so fascinating about it, I mean, I'm a basketball fan, okay? You know, I'm a long-suffering Knicks fan, right? <laughs> but um, to me, that isn't, a, I, I'm not enough interested just in the game that I would necessarily write a book just about basketball. Right. To me, to me, um, you know, what's interesting about this story is about not just the basketball, but about what it reveals mm -hmm. about the society, right? That it opens a window onto uh, urban life, you know, on, onto racism, onto political power, onto corruption, you know? Um, and it really tells a story about those larger issues, you know. Um, so that that was really the thing that I think was most interesting to me about it. And I have to say, you know, it was a hard book to write in certain ways, but the reaction to the book has been so gratifying. You know, people really like the book. And, and I was a little worried about what City College itself was going to think right. about the book. Because City doesn't necessarily come off that well uh, in the book, even though I love City College. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, I've been so gratified by the response from City. You know, the president of the college allowed me to have the book launch in the Great Hall mm -hmm. um, at City College. He introduced me, you know, that night. He said, this is the book we've been waiting decades for. Wow. Now we can finally talk about this. You know, it's been kind of swept under the rug for decades. And then during the question and answer period, it was me and the president and Floyd Lane, uh, you know, together on, on stage. Floyd was able to talk from the heart about, about his life. Right. Uh, it was incredibly moving. And then all of the members of the current basketball team were there in the crowd. And somebody bought each of them a copy of the book. Wow. And I saw at one point Floyd Lane signing the copies yeah. of, of the book for them. And I thought, wow, this is the way that traditions get passed down through the generations, you know. Yes. So that was really meaningful to me. So it's been, it's been just a terrific experience. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool that the, the college and the president embraced it. I'm sure it's been a sore spot uh, for them for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then when you have the unknown, rumors could start or, or misconceptions. Mm -hmm. But if somebody's laying out the truth, mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We can we can stand by mm -hmm. the truth. I was looking at your acknowledgments and uh, some of the people you uh, spoke with. Recently, I hosted an event called the My City Alumni Classic, where I bring back alumni mm -hmm. from some of these local colleges mm -hmm. and we compete against each other like in our glory oh, nice. days. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Nice. Yeah. Give us a chance to come back together and do it. Um, this past year, we had uh, a city college team. And it's gentlemen from all type of years. Uh, uh, some members were from the 2003 championship squad. And uh, one of those members was the great Dana Warner. Oh, yeah. Who was the son. Oh, what a, what a guy. Of yeah. Ed Warner. Yep. 
What was it like? Uh, Who's a basketball coach himself? Yes, Dana. he is. Yeah. What was yeah. it like communicating with him about the situation? Was he aware of it? Uh, is it a little uncomfortable to talk to these individuals about their family mm-hmm. members? What, what what was that research like? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I spoke to all of the surviving members of the team, but a lot of them have since passed on, right? Because, you know, Floyd is going to be close to 90 at this point. Um, so when, the, you know, the guys who had passed, I spoke to their widows, I spoke to their kids, uh, I spoke to their friends, you know, you know and so forth. And, you know, Ed Warner passed young. Um, he had been in a terrible car accident and, you know, et cetera, and he died young. Um, but I spoke to two of his sons, Dana and Ed Warner Jr. And uh, I have to say, um, they were so proud of their dad, you know. And, um, you know, with some of, the, some of the relatives, there's a little bit of hesitancy at first, you know. I'm not sure what your take is on this. We've been burned in the past when we talk to reporters and then it doesn't come out the way that we intended it to come out or, you know, we get manipulated or whatever. And I kind of had to, and, and the players themselves felt that way. And I had, I had to get, it took me a while to convince Floyd to talk to me. It took months and months, you know, of, of, of trying. Um, but um, I, I ended up, you know, winning over, you know, the, the families and I spoke to all the families and, you know, Dana was great um, because he's so proud of his dad. He's got his father's name on his tattooed on his arm and his birth date, but not his death date, he said, because he still lives in me. Yeah. Right. So it was very moving. Um, and the same thing with with Ed uh, Jr. Um, and, you know, they love Floyd. Floyd was kind of a god godfather for them, you know, uh, helped raise them. Um, so. No, it's been great. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, the research. What do you think was the breakthrough with Floyd Lane? Why do you think he finally came around and, and allowed <laughs> you to? Uh, uh, I ask work myself a that. Um, you know, it's funny. I I spoke to another guy on the team, a guy a guy called uh, Ron Nadell, and I went out to his house out on the island, and I spoke to him a couple of times. And I think that Ron may have told him, like, you know, this guy's okay, you know. Uh, but I'll say this. The first time, the first two times that I spoke to Floyd, uh, I could only do it. He would only do it in his lawyer's office. Mm. Wow. Okay. I'm like, Floyd, <laughs> you know, I, the statute of limitations has run out on this one, you know. Um, but that was the only way that he felt comfortable, you know, was to have his attorney present there. And so here's, you know, here's the truth, which is that um, uh, his attorney was, was there, and I was paying his attorney's fees for his time, right? Oh. So it was the most expensive interview I've ever done, but ultimately really worth it. And ultimately, I won Floyd's trust, mm-hmm. and eventually I was just calling him up on the phone, and you know, we were talking and so forth. And then, you know, as I mentioned, he came to the event, and we did the event together, and... Uh, uh, it was great. But, you know, Floyd was somebody who, who really had been hurt by the scandal, mm-hmm. really felt shamed by it, and had been misused, you know, in the press, and had spent really his life trying to get out from under the shadow, because he's a great man. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is something, this is a mistake that he had made that he didn't even really want to make when he was like 19 years old, Mm -hmm. right? And now he's in his 80s. And here's some dude coming along saying, I want to write a whole book about you. Well, I can understand why he would be a little bit hesitant at first about that. But but ultimately, I was so gratified. What did he say when he got through the finished product? Uh, He loved it. He loved it. And... um, you know, he loved the opportunity to to talk about it, you know, and to uh, talk about his teammates. You know, they all stayed friends, yeah. you know, their whole life. Uh, Ron Nadell came, you know, to the event, the, the the guy that I mentioned, you know, and he and Floyd were together. And- Matthew, this has got to be vindicating mm-hmm. for them. I think so. To live with this shadow. Okay, I made a mistake at 19. But yeah, I think so. To provide so. this contest? I think so. I hope so. That was a big part of why I did it, you know. 
um, not to make these guys out to be saints, right. but just to make them out to be people, yeah. you know, just to make them out to be complicated, um, interesting people. And they really were, you know, the, I mean, it happened that this team was, you know, composed of a gr- group of really interesting people um, who had real relationships with each other and really cared for each other. That's why they were able to win the way that they did, you know, because they had this ama- amazing connection on the court and off the court. Um, and so I was really lucky, you know. I, I just feel really blessed as, a, as an author to have found this story that hadn't really been told before and to have been allowed to get to know people like Floyd people like Eddie Roman's family, people like Eddie Warner's family, um, who, you know, who are just wonderful, yeah. really wonderful. And to be able to kind of right a wrong, you know, that had been, that had been told for many years. Sounds good. Matthew, let's put a bow on it. Uh, the city game, tribe, scandal, and a legendary basketball team. Uh, where can people get this book? Where can they follow you? That that's that book is everywhere. So you know it's in paperback. Uh, it's in hard and paper. It's on um, um, audiobook. You know Kindle, etc. It's available on Amazon. It's available in in stores. Um, and uh, I'm at MatthewGoodmanBooks.com. That's my that's my website. I'm on Twitter at Matthew Goodman Books. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Did you do the audio for the audio book? I did not. Okay. I did not. But a great, a great guy did. He's better. He's got a better voice than I did. <laughs> Mr. Matthew Goodman, this was amazing. Thank you so um, much. Really, I really, really enjoyed great. the book. I enjoyed the podcast. Uh, I'll be tuned in to the next project. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that's WBH Radio. I'm William Holly.